What, what role does uh, wages play in some wage rises? Uh, obviously, you've covered that in the document. I, I know uh, from you know, speaking to friends who are talking about inflation at the moment, talking about whether their uh, employers are, are given pay rises. And you know, it's a tough time at the moment because it looks like we're heading into recession. We may even be in recession. So small rate raises I know are happen, but happening, but they're real world uh, deductions. I know even in the UK, there was like an agreed amount for the nurses. I think it was three, I don't know what the amount, Danny can look it up, but there was an amount agreed for the nurses. And whether it's one, two or 3% they're arguing about, that is still a real world uh, pay cut mm -hmm. because of the inflation levels. But private businesses have a, a lot more scope to yeah. to right, raise wages. They you know they run their own balance sheet. They know what, the, what their uh, company's doing. Um, my, my understanding is that the problem with those in maybe the more poorest who, who are either, either surviving on welfare or have got minimum wage jobs, you're not going to see a rise in a uh, regulated or mandated minimum wage that's going to be inflation. You're not going to see a 10% rise or 15% rise. So does that create another issue? Well, there, there's a lot to say about this topic. First is that wages usually lag the price increases, right? So inflation happens first most of the time, not always, but most of the time inflation will happen first and then people will raise wages to try to, you know, to catch up with that. Sometimes it goes the other way, but but usually the inflation happens first and wages, wage increases happen later. And so you're still feeling the bite of inflation. Maybe over time it sort of keeps up, but but you're still feeling the bite of it. So generally speaking, inflation still does affect you. And then there's the, the point that we were alluding to earlier about the fact that um, if you're wealthy, you benefit from inflation, right? If you yeah. own your home, your home prices are going up. If you own a, a, you know, a 401k or a stock portfolio, those things go up in inflation events. Those of us who own Bitcoin, Bitcoin has benefited from all the easy money, et cetera, right? So, so, so all that to say that, there, there, that, that the wealth inequality does definitely occur, and, and I think we documented pretty persuasively in this paper, Another piece of it that is uh, that, that you're reminding me of with the comment about you know people who are on welfare versus not, is that most welfare benefits, including social security, pension benefits, type public pension benefits, are indexed to CPI or some other CPI related formula. So um, Medicaid spending or food stamp spending or social security spending will go up. But if you are privately employed, if you are if you are a member of a working age population, or and you're in the workforce, and you're getting you're depending on your employer to keep uh, uh, to keep pace with inflation, that lags. So you create this kind of two tiered track where on one track there are the people who are either government employees or who get their benefits from the government primarily, whose pay may go up uh, over time because of government formulas that make sure that those payments track inflation. On the other side. Uh, if you um, if you have a minimum wage job or uh, a job that's not uh, tracking inflation in the private sector, if you're in the working poor, you're going to fall further behind. So the wealthy are going to do well. People whose pay is from the government may you know keep pace with CPI, but if you're not in one of those two categories, um, you're going to struggle more. So that's going to create more resentment, more potential. Uh, certainly political unrest, if not worse. And uh, it's it's a huge problem. And so this field, you know, we went through all the academic literature. We actually said, okay, who's working on this? And it's really remarkable how, you know, inequality is like the dominant topic in every area of political and economic policy, except inflation. This is like the one area where just people, almost nobody is working on it. And so we just felt it was really important for us to throw our hat in the ring there, and, and hopefully we did some something useful on it. But I want to go back to your, your point there. Even if welfare tracks to CPI, we've already said that CPI is an average. Yep. So actually, they, they are still seeing a real, real totally. world decrease, even if it tracks CPI. That's true, yeah. Is there any, have you done any work looking at those who maybe who are uh, the working but maybe on a win minimum wage, that this creates an incentive not to work? Um. That is something that we're very interested in as a follow-on area. So okay. there's there's a whole, you know, we we a lot of people are talking in the U.S. I don't know what's going on in the U.K. or in Europe, but in the U.S. there's there's increasing amount of commentary on this, the Great Resignation. It's being called that a lot of people who were thrown out of their jobs during COVID or maybe quit because they felt unsafe going back to work 
have realized that or felt that for whatever reason that they don't want to go back to work or they can't find a, a job or uh, we don't really know. There, there's not really good survey data on this yet, but there's a lot of people who dropped out of the workforce during COVID who have not re-entered the workforce as COVID has subsided. And it's pretty alarming. And there I guess various reasons for that. Some, yeah, they maybe have got a partner who's working, it's not worth going back, but maybe their, their stimulus or their welfare payments are enough. But maybe they have a cash side hustle. Yeah, it could be all those things. That, you yeah. know, the thing I worry about, and I hope is not the case, but what I worry about and what we need to do research on is what if there are a lot of people out there who worked because they felt that was what they were supposed to do. They were supposed right. to work. That was the way they survived, the way they get by, the way they were part of society. And they lost their job during COVID. They got some of the the, the relief money and and started participating in some of these government programs. And then felt at the end of that, well, wow, these programs pay me as much as I was making before and there's no income taxes on this money. So that's actually a pretty good setup. And so they don't go back to work because of that. And what there's an enormous amount of research that shows that people who fall into that, um, that track end up much less happy, much less fulfilled in certain ways, lose a lot of their connection to, to society and to communities if they are not in a position where they're working in, in the more conventional, traditional way. And so that's something that welfare reformers have have long talked about. The whole welfare reform effort in the 1990s under Bill Clinton was all about this. We the best welfare program is a job because that's what not only gives you that sense of fulfillment and that sense of being part of a team, part mm-hmm. of a group of people, but you can you can work harder, you can make more money, you can get even do even better over time. And you can't do that on a welfare program. There's only, there's a limit to how much uh, you can earn on welfare, and then that's it. And so people get kind of in a rut in that situation. So uh, again, we don't know yet if that's what's happening, but that's what I'm, I worry about. Yeah. Okay. Well, if you do do work on that, I'd love, I'd love to see it. Um, okay. So with regards to inflation, historical target of governments is 2%, sometimes mm-hmm. you know, overshoot, sometimes undershoot. Yeah. And you've said even at that level, that compounds over years. Is inflation actually necessary? We've always been told it's necessary because if we have deflation, people won't spend and that might lead to recession. Is 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 that bullshit? Just something that the government says because inflation allows them to expand the monetary base as kind of you know, over time? Or is there a genuine risk of deflation? Well, before we even get to that, we should mention, and you may have talked about this with some of your other guests, I don't remember, but um, the Fed did something very significant last year, uh, which is they... Uh, moved from a de facto ceiling on inflation, where they tried to keep inflation under 2% at all times, to what they now call flexible average inflation targeting, where the average inflation rate is supposed to be 2%, but it can go above at some time and go below. And the idea is that they'll, they're so good at managing inflation that they'll be able to keep it at an average of 2%, which of course they as soon as they did that, inflation basically blew through their average and is now out of control. So that was a major policy change by the Fed. It changed a policy that had been around either explicitly or implicitly for decades. So that was a huge choice by the Fed that turned out very disastrously for them. So that's something we should just note in in, in a preface to what, what your question mm-hmm. is. But I, I'm with you. I mean, I, I would argue as a, as a Bitcoiner that the, the supply of money should be as close to constant as possible, or at the very least, only minimally growing, uh, but, but ideally constant. Um, that's obviously very far afield from where we are today. So you couldn't, you couldn't you know, wave, wave a magic wand and convert the dollar to that mode without massive, massive financial and economic disruption. So I'm not advocating that as what the Fed should do tomorrow, but Yes, in an ideal world, at the very least, we should shoot for 0% CPI, not 2% CPI. On top of that, we need to measure inflation more accurately. And, and this gets to some of the stuff that obviously Bitcoiners talk about a lot in terms of the, the Cantillon or Cantillon effect, uh, where uh, inflation is not this thing that symmetrically raises all prices equally. And, and one of the problems in our inflation debate, actually, is that there's, there's actually a big difference among what we might call monetary hawks or monetary conservatives, and that there's what we might call the Milton Friedman school and what we might call the von Mises or Austrian school. And the difference is that the the Austrians would say the supply of money should be effectively constant because that's the the most, that's the gold standard of hard money, right? Literally. Uh, 
Friedman's view was a little different. Friedman's view was that the monetary supply should uh, track economic growth, roughly speaking. I'm oversimplifying to some degree, but that's what he would say. He'd say, if you want CPI or prices to be constant, then yes, you can grow the money supply, but just grow it roughly around the way that the economy is growing. If you do that, then prices will be stable. Um, And that's what a lot of, you know, of the sort of right-leaning or hawkish-leaning people at the Fed uh, claim to support is the Friedman model. And I personally am of the view that the Friedman model is wrong because of the Cantillon effect, that uh, prices don't symmetrically increase. This is the insight of the of the Austrians and of Cantillon himself. So that's one division that cre- makes it harder to reform the Fed, which is to say that there's the doves, there's the Friedmanite hawks, and then there's the Austrians who are sort of seen as these completely Crazy. outre illegitimate participants in debate. If, you, if you're an Austrian, if you're a Bitcoiner, if you're like a gold bug, if you're any of those categories, if you're even Peter Schiff, you know, you're like, <laughs> there he is in the corner. If you're even Peter Schiff or Steve Hankey, uh, uh, or one of these guys, like, you, you know, Steve, actually, Hankey is more of a Friedman, Friedman guy. So uh, I'm, I'm not sure where Schiff falls on that, on that front, but Hankey is very much a Friedman guy. But all this to say that, like, there's, they are at least somewhat part of, they're on the far end of the mainstream conversation and Austrians slash Bitcoiners are not, right? They're totally mm. off of the mainstream. So we have a long way to go to have a monetary policy that is as sound as what Bitcoin's monetary policy is. But at the very least, if we could get to the Friedman approach, which we might call a center, center right or center hawkish in the, in the monetary context, not in the broader political or partisan context, but in the context of monetary policy, the sort of mainstream hawk view might be, let's have 0% or uh, inflation. That would be sort of the far end of the hawkish spectrum. And, and I think that should be the goal. And I will say there are people who support that. There are people in Washington, and Pat Toomey has, has, has alluded to this. He's the uh, retiring Republican ranking member on the Senate Banking Committee who has jurisdiction over some of the stuff. And, uh, and and he said, yeah, some people believe, and I respect their views, that inflation should be 0%. Um, and we would be a, 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 a more a fairer country and a less regressive country when it comes to the evolution of prices if we strove for 0% inflation instead of 2%. But, you know, what, what do the Keynesian and what do the, the mainstream economists say to that? They say, well, if you had 0% inflation – then people would have an incentive to save instead of spend. By the way, why is that such a bad idea? Well, it's terrible. I mean, can you imagine if people saved all their money instead of spending it, then GDP would shrink or something. Like that's the argument. The argument is that unless you steer people into spending their money, then the economy would sort of die. And that's not true. We, we, you know, if, if my money is appreciating the bank, I'm still going to spend it on food, on a house, TVs. On trips to Nashville to see you, I'm gonna I'm gonna spend money on things. I'm, yeah, I'm gonna buy a TV. I'm, like we're all gonna spend money. That's what that's what we do with money. So this idea that somehow people are gonna stop spending money if somehow they're rewarded for saving is is just one of these theories that every mainstream economist believes that isn't true. Uh, and that's a it's a major error in monetary policy. My expectation with that as well is that people will become more considerate, though, about what they spend their money yeah, on. Yeah, sure. Which would encourage people who are producers of products and services to have to produce better products and services. I think right. we've we've been a little bit too exposed to people getting away with producing absolute shit. I think the fast fashion industry is an example of that, and uh, I think we should move away from that. I, I I don't see the issue with having people save, but I I, I think some of this is. Well, I, I think this is really the result of poor economic policy that the narrative changes. Yeah, you know, I mean, the way the way I, I'd put it is that a lot of people, particularly intellectuals, like to complain about our consumerist culture in America. Well, what creates a consumerist culture? A monetary policy that destroys the long-term value and reward for saving your own money. 